We are witnessing an historical transformation in how we organise our societies, economies and politics. That is the premise for today's conversation. Welcome to Exponential. <laughs> I want to know if the profound uncertainty that seems to underpin modern life is actually part of something bigger, our version of the Industrial Revolution. Are we living through a monumental transition driven by exponential technologies? Will that redefine the distribution of power for generations to come? One of the main assumptions behind today's premise is that the really big turning points in history have been driven by technology. We know that agriculture gave birth to civilization itself. Gutenberg's printing press transformed Europe because it let ideas travel faster than ever before. In the 18th century, the steam engine brought us the Industrial Revolution, reshaping the world. Is today's tech industry doing the same? I've come to the intellectual heart of Silicon Valley, Stanford University, to find out. My guest today is a world expert on how economics, politics and technology collide. This show is called Exponentially. And what we're trying to investigate is the extent to which this series of interconnected changes, particularly rapid technological change, but also the climate crisis and things like pandemics that are all different but somehow related that might reflect some kind of change in the way that we live our lives. Do you see, as I do, complicated domains that are changing very, very quickly, or are we overreading what we're seeing? Well, if you went into the typical windowless room full of uh, professional chatter merchants from the various elites of the world, and you asked that kind of question, I think the answers would include, well, there is some huge paradigm shift happening in the global climate that will have terrible consequences. There are technological changes, particularly in the area of artificial intelligence that are exponential with the rapid growth of large language models. And it's all very scary. And somebody will say, because we're in a polycrisis and everything is happening all at once. And, and this is unprecedented, which just means they don't know any history. So let's just run a thought experiment. Mm. Supposing you and I were having this conversation with somewhat different technology in 1923 rather than right. 2023. I'm sure that there would be uh, somebody in, in the windowless room uh, who would say, well, uh, we've, we just had a tremendous pandemic in 1918-19 and a huge conflict. Uh, the world is being uh, mm -hmm. driven crazy by inflation. And then there are these alarming breakthroughs in technology that are producing moving pictures, right, uh, cinema. Of and, and it feels like they would have had some sense of, uh, of impending disaster. Uh, and, and I think we have to therefore guard against saying things that were also being said 100 years ago. Uh, so I think the first thing to do is beware of assuming that the year you happen to be in is hugely historically significant. Well, it might not be. No, well, every year, in a sense, is unprecedented. Yeah. Unprecedented things are actually quite, quite common in life. Right. So I'll dissent a bit from yeah. conventional wisdom by trying to highlight the things that I think really are important about now. Because most of the things we attach significance to turn out not to be important. In the early 70s, people thought a huge population crisis was coming. Absolutely. And this was the dominant view. If I can jump in though, if, if we look back over the long arc of history, we can see moments where there were these paradigm shifts, you can see the economy of England looks very, very different in 1750 to how it looked 150 years earlier before the discovery and exploitation of coal. If we look at the structure of power and economies in, in Europe in the 200 years after the printing press, they look quite different to how they looked just 100 years before the printing press. You've mentioned two mm. and you'll struggle to come up with five because the Industrial Revolution is one of the very rare moments where human history resembles the, the hockey stick. Uh, right. it, it, there is a really exponential change in, in, in economic life and it involves a massive enhancement of human productivity uh, through technology. 
Uh, the printing press is the thing that transforms communication mm -hmm. uh, in the 16th and 17th century. Again, it happens in Western Europe and then gradually spreads to the rest of the world. But these are very exceptional historical conjunctures and they don't come along uh, as frequently as, as London buses. So let, let's ask ourselves, is it plausible that something like that has happened in our time? And the answer is it has, because the internet has had about the same impact in our lifetimes as the printing press had uh, over a more prolonged period. How do you measure the impact well, of the internet? If in you one? simply compare the cost of communication, mm -hmm. it was reduced as much by the internet as it was by the printing press. Well, I, there's something else that I think is quite interesting about the spread of the internet, because when it started to spread, the idea was that it would energize local democracy, it would energize the individual, it would give us all a voice. And, and up until the point of the Arab Spring, uh, you could make that case. And a decade on, we've seen that that democracy didn't take root. Yeah. And we've also seen that these new non-state actors in the form of the platforms have found ways of sequestering the de democratic capability of the internet into something that doesn't look too dissimilar to mass media with a little hint of Orwell. I think the, the same kind of disappointment arose with the rise of the printing press. I mean, there, there certainly was a moment when it seemed as if the advent of, of very cheap printed uh, books would allow uh, Christian doctrine to spread everywhere very rapidly. But what in fact happened was that once Martin Luther started to argue for Absolutely. improvements in Western Christendom, you had about a uh, hundred plus years of, of very violent religious warfare. Uh, and in the same way, we thought everything would be awesome if everybody was connected on network platforms, uh, Google, Amazon and the rest. It took us a few years to realize that there might be downsides to a much enhanced interconnectivity. So I think that kind of thing illustrates why you need to study history if you're not to misunderstand the paradigm shifts of your, of your time. The thing that I would add that mm. might turn out to be comparable mm -hmm. is the, the rise of artificial intelligence. Right, exactly. I and mean, that does feel like something that's really transformative. Well, it, it looks like it's a technology that could dramatically improve productivity. It could be that given that we have this productivity enhancing technology that is that is AI that has come off the back of this transformative communications network that's the internet and we have a fundamental shift in the way the energy system is working as we we move from extractive sources through to renewable sources. You mean other extractive resources because renewables involve extraction. But the ratio of extraction to useful energy is much, much more in favor of renewables than it is with, with oil and gas. And that feels like a, the energy system could also change. So there, there could be the ingredients of a, of a pivot point of a kind that we've only seen a couple of times previously in history. But let's ask what the driving forces will be. The world is propelled forward and has been for thousands of years by great power competition. That's right. Uh, and that, that is the thing that drives uh, innovation right now across the board, whether it's uh, in solar panels or in artificial in intelligence. It is a competition which is intensifying between two superpowers, the United States uh, and a communist-led superpower. Now, is this starting to sound familiar? It does. So what is really significant about this historical moment is that we are in the first inning, the early phase of Cold War II. Right. And that is going to drive all the things that we've talked about, and it will not necessarily drive uh, these changes in directions that are benign. That the big technological advance of Cold War I was, of course, nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And the arms race with nuclear weapons was an extremely dangerous one uh, that very nearly blew the world up, particularly in 1962, That's at the right. time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. I don't believe for a minute that we can have a Cold War II without a similar risk, one of which is it has its hot aspects. There's a hot war going on right now in Ukraine. The Cuban Missile Crisis in this Cold War will be a Taiwan semiconductor crisis. Yeah. And, and in that sense, I think, if you try to imagine yourself as a future historian, you'll be writing about how the US-China rivalry, both ideological mm -hmm. and technological, produced uh, moments of great risk before the superpowers found out a way of managing it better. I think it's always the case, though, that breakthroughs in technology will lead to 
uh, great power competition. I mean, the square rigged sails uh, resulted in those expeditions from the Iberian Peninsula that started that wave of colonization. Uh, steel and larger bore guns turned into competition in, in Europe when we got to World War I. It's the other way around, actually, Azim. It's actually the competition that leads to the technological development. And this is the reason that there's so much more technological innovation in Europe uh, than in China from around 1500, is that there are relatively mm -hmm. evenly matched states engaged in a competition. Right. A peer-to-peer -peer conflict incentivized European states to innovate uh, with shipbuilding uh, and particularly to innovate with artillery. And in the same way, it's clearly uh, the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union that propels innovation uh, with nuclear weapons. And in the same way today, I think the United States and China are in a race uh, with respect to artificial intelligence, uh, quantum computing, and a whole range of other technologies. Because yeah. once you're in that great power competition, you cannot afford to lose uh, technological leadership. But the current competition between uh, China and the US started with civil applications of these technologies. So it's been a case of plowshares into swords. Uh, we were not developing AI or genome sequencing first and foremost for military advantage. We were developing them for their, their innovation capacities, which would lead to economic advantage. And Chinese scientists and American scientists uh, were cooperating in all kinds of, of domains in a relatively short space of time, up until, I guess, Xi Jinping came to power uh, in, in China and Donald Trump came to power in the United States. People in the United States really yep. underestimated the extent to which almost all the technologies were potentially dual use. That is right. to say they had civilian but also military usages. Uh, they underestimated the extent to which their own military hardware, US military hardware, had Chinese components. Absolutely. And I think that that's, for me, one of the most interesting things about our time, that we went really quite quickly from what I called Chimerica in 2007 to Cold War II in, by about 2018. Right. And that's another big historical change that I think we'll look back on. Something else happened between 2007 and, and about 2015, which was in, in technology, things that we now called AI went from being slightly mundane and not usable to suddenly quite useful. There was enough of a technical breakthrough that could be picked up and run with to create competition in an environment where trust perhaps had been shaken. I think historically, technological innovation sometimes seems like its own story that's somewhat separate from everything else. In the 1970s, uh, most people thought that the world was in stagflation, but that was actually the decade when Microsoft and Apple Absolutely. were founded. And, so, and Intel was building chips for the very first time and so on. And that turned out to really matter in Cold War I because the Soviets were able to steal and copy the technology of nuclear weapons. But when it came to copying microprocessors, they utterly failed. And I think in that sense, what happened in the 1970s in Silicon Valley turned out to be strategically hugely important once the Soviets realized that the next generation of weapons would depend on microprocessors and computers. That's why, from a technological point of view, they couldn't possibly win Cold right. War I. Now, Cold War II, I think, has similar characteristics. It does. It's going to be decided by, at the technological frontier, at the moment, there are two respects in which I think this is much closer than Cold War I. Number one, obviously, the Chinese economy is bigger than the Soviet economy ever was. Ever was yeah. I mean, it was 44% of US GDP at peak and falling away from the mid-1970s. Uh, China overtook the US in 2014 on a purchasing power parity basis. It's not that far behind on a current dollar basis. So that's point one. Point two, just the way that the Chinese economy works, because it has a very large and dynamic private sector, is more likely to produce competitive innovation than the Soviets ever could. Which brings us to something we haven't talked about mm -hmm. yet, which is super important, demographics and migration. And your point about demographics is that many countries are in retrograde, not just Japan, not just Italy, but also China and large parts of Eastern Europe are well below the replacement rate. The population of China could fall by as much as half 
between now and the end of this century. That is a plausible projection from the United Nations. Even the median projection from the UN population prospect says that the population of China will fall by about a third. How can the Chinese economy possibly have sustained growth at even 5% with a shrinking population, a shrinking workforce? Absolutely. 29% of the economy is building tower blocks, but these are tower blocks for nobody. And I don't think well, we're thinking enough about what that means. But we can perhaps bring in one of the technologies we talked about earlier, which was these AI technologies technologies, because of course they are productivity magnifying technologies, at least that's a theory. So let's assume for the discussion that they allow one person to do the, the work of three or four. That might suggest that countries like China or Italy should invest more heavily in these AI technologies because they are running out of human workers. But I'm not sure that that solves the problem because I think the problem is somewhat more complex than we don't have enough people to assemble the electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. The politics of the 21st century will be about generational conflict, not class conflict. And we're still at an early stage of the generational conflicts that are going to play out as younger people say to themselves, wait a second, I seem to be having a a pretty hard Tough time, time uh, in order to support uh, the older generation in very yeah. prolonged retirement. So there are strong echoes of that in, in the US with college debt burden, in the UK with the cost of, uh, of housing right. and, and in, in France and in Italy as, yeah. as well. So there are, we're starting to see that sort of the graying of the power structure because of the shift in demographics. And China yeah. has got a, a huge one coming. And it's going to age as rapidly as, as Japan has, but at a lower level of per capita GDP. So I think that that doesn't get solved by, by robots. And I think there's another problem for aging societies. I mean, it's the young people who have the cool ideas. Uh, and if you have an, an aging population, uh, it seems to me that by definition, you, you will be less innovative in relative terms. So historically, are there examples that you can think of where nations or states of some sort have really bet hard on technology to get them out, out of one of these quite existential threats. No, this is new territory because the problem in the past uh, was altogether different. Uh, human life expectancy, we, we forget this, uh, was pretty short for most of history. Uh, and so, you know, people didn't uh, feel young at 59. Mm. I still kid myself that I'm relatively youthful, at least physically. You're about to take up an, a new sport in golf, I understand. Well, I don't regard golf as a sport, to be honest. But yeah, it's the kind of thing you do when you hit your 60s. But the interesting thing is that all the times of technological innovation that we look back on happen when societies were extraordinarily youthful uh, by our standards. And the elderly were a really small share of the population. Where have we got to? There are some new technologies. The internet and artificial intelligence, they feel like a paradigm shift. There are some more linear uh, trends, demographics being an, a key untold story. And these together are driving a real Cold War II between, between China and America. Some scholars argue that in many cases where great powers, especially if there are ideological differences that are, that are hard to reconcile, find themselves competing, they will fall into a war. I think if we're going to rerun this and have Cold War II, we should not assume that we're guaranteed to avoid a hot war. The technologies include the old ones, nuclear weapons, but there are a bunch of new ones All too. Hypersonics, and hypersonic AI, missiles, and cyber. AI, satellite warfare is going to happen on a Bio. far larger scale. Yeah. So I have to say that I agree with Henry Kissinger, who said to me in an interview not unlike this last year, Cold War II will be more dangerous than Cold War I. That is a very sobering thought to me. After the end of World War II, we developed a whole set of new institutions from the United Nations through to things like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that were used to regulate the, the sort of the worst possible outcomes. Is it a case of having to invent new institutions or is it a case of transforming the ones that we, we have? The United Nations, uh, when you look closely at its record, 
uh, had a structural problem from the outset, namely the veto power of, of the, the permanent members. The full permanent members initially, uh, And so right. the permanent members included the United States and the Soviet Union, and so they took turns to exercise that veto, which meant that the UN didn't actually do terribly much that was consequential when it came to avoiding conflict, which is why there were a lot of small and not so small wars during Cold War I. That's right. The, the illustration of the problem uh, which was brought home to us forcibly last year is that if Russia decides to invade Ukraine, the UN Security Council becomes a sham institution. And so you ask yourself, well, hang on a second, if these institutions are kind of dysfunctional, uh, what was it that generated at least some peace and prosperity uh, after 1945? And I think the answer is, in fact, alliance systems that deterred uh, right. The Soviets from the more crazy of the plans. So that fundamentally, they had. NATO. NATO mattered much more yeah. than the UN. Therefore, if we want to ask the question, how can we avoid World War III? It is going to be very important that the United States builds a version of NATO for the Trans Pacific uh, right. relations. Interests but, are eternal, I think. Well, this sounds like Henry Kissinger talking right back at me, yeah. but <laughs> I think in practice, this is where the action is. Can the United States create a sufficiently strong network of relationships that China can be deterred from taking the kind of action that could escalate uh, to but, World so, War III? But there were other dimensions at of risk that you, you talked about, and one was artificial intelligence. And even in their non-weaponized state, because they're dual use, yeah. they can still be quite dangerous. Just in the same way that the Peace of Westphalia devised a set of rules to stop religious warfare tearing Europe apart uh, interminably, so in the Cold War, international agreements restrained the superpowers from uh, proliferating nuclear weapons, developing and using biological and chemical weapons. So why should we not now devise a convention to limit the use of, uh, of these new and powerful tools, especially now when the United States appears to have a pretty clear lead when it comes to large language models. Mm -hmm. Just as it was in uh, the interest of the United States to have a non-proliferation treaty before the Soviets overtook yeah. uh, the US in well, nuclear well, weapons. Back then, of course, even the Swedes had a nuclear weapons uh, program. Imagine a world without the non-proliferation treaty. It yes. would have blown up by now. Right, absolutely. And the Swedes would have reconquered Finland. <laughs> in their <laughs> dreams, in their dreams. Uh, now, the premise of today's conversation was that if we look back on these few years, we'll realise that we were living through a paradigm shift that was a new age. How do you assess that, that premise? Is that something that is now going to become reality? Not in the way that most people think. I think we're at that stage of Cold War II where most people don't fully realise the implications of there being only two AI superpowers, only two superpowers that could conceivably have quantum computers. And that that's the real architecture uh, of the rest of our lives. Everything ends up being a part of this great geopolitical struggle. It's because the logic of power is unaffected by technology. I think, for me, the key to understanding the future is you have to combine historical knowledge, because power and love are perennial, with a grasp of what's new, what's technologically different. There's a paradigm shift happening in technology, no question. But the age-old relationships between powers, those don't change. And you have to understand both these domains or you will be caught napping. Reflecting on my conversation with Neil, I'm struck by how many factors, from global competition to demographic shifts and rapidly evolving tech, are all contributing to a state of uncertainty. Is this a sign of a fundamental change in human affairs? Consider the internet. In just 50 years, it spread globally, connecting 5 billion of us together in this dynamic network. Technological progress is speeding up and the collaboration the internet represented is being replaced by a competition between the two great powers, China and the US. And yes, there are parallels with the Cold War. And I'd agree with Neil that we are seeing the flickerings of a serious standoff. But I think something more fundamental is also happening, a shift to a world built on exponential technologies with many new power brokers, not just the nation states. I'm Azim Azar, and you've been watching Exponentially.